Legally Blonde is a movie that follows the Harvard Law School journey of L. Woods, who starts off as an intelligent but otherwise superficial blonde from Southern California. Have you wondered how much of the movie accurately portrays law school life? Today I will go through the legal parts of the movie, explaining what's real and what's fiction. Hello, Lawlings. This is Professor Bo Baez. My goal today is to provide you with my observations on Legally Blonde, bringing over two decades of teaching experience at six law schools. So without any further ado, let's begin. Well, you know how we've been having all kinds of fun lately? Yeah. Well, Harvard is going to be different. Law school is a completely different world, and I need to be serious. Of course. I mean, my family expects a lot from me. Right. I expect a lot from mm -hmm. me. I plan on running for office someday. And I fully support that, Warner. You know that, right? Absolutely. Okay. But the thing is, if I'm going to be a senator by the time I'm 30, I need to stop dicking around. Oh, Warner, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I think it's time for us. L. Pooh Bear. I think I we do. should break up. <laughs> what? Well, I've been thinking about it, and I think it's the right thing to do. You're breaking up with me? I thought you were proposing. Proposing? <laughs> Elle, <sighs> if I'm going to be a senator, well, I need to marry a Jackie, not a Marilyn. He is absolutely correct that law school's hard, the top law schools provide opportunities not only in politics, but also government, nonprofits, large law firms, the judiciary, and academia. But getting into law school isn't enough. The best opportunities go to those at the top of the class, and that means minimizing outside commitments. The unfortunate reality is that many marriages don't survive law school, let alone dating relationships. My name is Elle Woods, and for my admissions essay, I'm going to tell all of you at Harvard why I'm going to make an amazing lawyer. As president of my sorority, I'm skilled at commanding the attention of a room and discussing very important issues. It has come to my attention that the maintenance staff is switching our toilet paper from Charmin to generic. All those opposed to chafing, please say I. I. When I was in the law school admissions committee, there was a student who submitted a video essay. I'm going to recommend against this, as there is a huge risk that it will backfire, alienating some people on the committee. Work on creating a great personal essay instead. But if you do submit an optional video essay, make sure it's not you in swimwear. And that's why you should vote for me, Elle Woods, future lawyer for the class of 2004. She does have a 4.0 from CULA, and she got a 179 on her LSATs. A fashion major? Well, sir, we've never had one before, and aren't we always looking for diversity? Her list of extracurricular activities is impressive. She was in a Ricky Martin video. Clearly, she's interested in music. She also designed a line of faux fur panties for her sorority's charity project. Uh-huh, she's a friend to the animals, as well as a philanthropist. Elle Woods. Welcome to Harvard. Most admissions decisions are not made by the faculty, but rather by the admissions department. Faculty set policy and decide difficult cases, such as students at the bottom of a law school LSAT and GPA range, or students with legal problems, like a drunk driving charge. And today, expect to see women and minorities on the faculty admissions committee. With a 4.0 and a 175, L's application would never have gone to the committee. Okay, welcome to law school. 
This is the part where we go around in a circle and everyone says a little bit about themselves. Let's start with you. Uh, my name is David Kidney. I have a master's in Russian literature, a PhD in biochemistry, and for the last 18 months I've been uh, deworming orphans in Somalia. Awesome. What about you? Hey, how you doing? I'm Enid Wexler. Got a PhD from Berkeley in Women's Studies, emphasis in the history of combat. And uh, last year, I single-handedly organized the march for lesbians against drunk driving. Killer. Thanks. Good times. Aaron Mitchell. I graduated first in my class from Princeton. I have an IQ of 187. <laughs> and it's been suggested that Stephen Hawking stole his brief history of time from my fourth grade paper. I never met any true geniuses in law school. Now some very smart people and a few PhDs in my class. And the PhDs were actually kind of fun. Regardless of where you go, you will suddenly find that you are a small fish in a big pond. This will be different for many of you who were at the top of your college class. Suddenly, there will be a lot of other bright people around you. Don't let that bother you, but rather, let your new friends challenge you so you can become the best you. And guess what? After finals, you'll find out that someone who you thought was super smart did not end up with one of the best grades. A legal education means you will learn to speak in a new language. You will be taught to achieve insight into the world around you and to sharply question what you know. The seat you have picked will be yours for the next nine months of your life. And those of you in the front row, beware. Some professors, including me, assign seats on the first day of class and pass out a seating chart, just like you see here. If you're not sure what your professor will do, Arrive early on that first day and pick your seat. I recommend sitting towards the front of the class so you remain engaged. The law is reason free from passion. Does anyone know who spoke those immortal words? Yeah. Aristotle. Are you sure? Yes. Would you be willing to stake your life on it? I think so. What about oh. his life? I don't know. Well, I recommend knowing before speaking. Ah, the eager student, who in law school lingo is called the gunner because they are constantly raising their hand. See how the professor tries to rattle him, causing him to doubt himself? Many professors do this not to embarrass, but to help students develop conviction. Just a few days ago, I was able to move one of my students from the correct answer to them saying they didn't know. I would rather that a student exude error with confidence than a correct answer with trepidation. Now, I assume all of you have read pages one through 48 and are now well-versed in subject matter jurisdiction. Who can tell us about Gordon versus Steele? Let's call on someone from the heart, sir. L. Woods. Oh. <laughs> um, actually, um, I wasn't aware that we had an assignment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Vivian Kensington, do you think it's acceptable that Ms. Woods is not prepared? <laughs> no. I don't. 
Would you support my decision to ask her to leave class and to return only when she is prepared? Absolutely. The first day of class has required reading, and you should be prepared to answer questions. Professors deal with unprepared students in different ways. Booting someone out of class is very old school. But I did have one colleague who did it that way. No one ever wanted to be kicked out of class. Too embarrassing. So students were always prepared. By the way, for a professor to ask a student whether she should kick someone else out of class is completely out of line. And this is in the movie to add some drama to the storyline. In addition to competing against each other for the top grade in this class, you will also be competing for one of my firm's highly coveted four internship spots next year, where you will get to assist on actual cases. Let the bloodbath begin. The professor refers to his firm. Under accreditation rules, a full-time law professor cannot be part of a law firm. The rule is different for adjuncts. But in a first-year class, it would be very unusual to have anyone but a full-time faculty member. Now, let's commence with our usual torture. Ms. Woods, would you rather have a client who committed a crime malum in se or malum prohibitum? Neither. And why is that? I would rather have a client who's innocent. <laughs> <laughs> Dare to dream, Ms. Woods. Ms. Kensington, which would you prefer? Malum prohibitum. Because then the client would have committed a regulatory infraction as opposed to a dangerous crime. Well done, Ms. Kensington. You've obviously done your homework. Now, let us look at Malum Prohibitum a little more closely. It has been said. Yes, Ms. Woods. I changed my mind. I'd pick the dangerous one, because I'm not afraid of a challenge. What the professor is really trying to get at is whether the student bothered to look up these two Latin phrases. Many students feel so overwhelmed that they don't look up words they don't know. So many professors will pick out those unique words and ask students about them. This means that you must look up all new words before class. It will be laborious at first, but you'll start building your vocabulary. I'm Elle Woods, Ms. Bonifante's attorney, and I'm here to discuss the legal situation at hand. During law school, you might be tempted to provide legal advice. Don't do it. One, you really don't know that much in law school to provide competent legal advice. And two, it's illegal. If the bar finds out, this could cause problems with your application to become a lawyer after graduation. Well, according to Swinney versus Newbert, Swinney, who was also a private sperm donor, was allowed visitation rights as long as he came to terms with the hours set forth by the parents. So if we're sticking to past precedent, I mean, Mr. Latimer wasn't stalking. He was clearly within his rights to ask for visitation. But Swinney was a one-time sperm donor. And in our case, the defendant was an habitual sperm donor who also happens to be harassing the parents in his quest for visitation. Well, yeah, but I mean, without this man's sperm, the child in question wouldn't exist. Now you're thinking like a lawyer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, Ms. Woods. Although Mr. Huntington makes an excellent point, I have to wonder if the defendant kept a thorough record of every sperm emission made throughout his life. <laughs> Interesting. Why do you ask? Well, unless the defendant attempted to contact every single one-night stand to determine if a child resulted in those unions, he has no parental claim over this child whatsoever. Why now? Why this sperm? I see your point. And for that matter, all masturbatory emissions where his sperm was clearly not seeking an egg could be termed reckless abandonment. I believe you've just won your case. Ms. Woods, you did well today.
This is the type of discussion that goes on in American law school classrooms. You are assigned to read an appellate judicial opinion before class, and then the professor engages in a Socratic dialogue. Sometimes, as we see here, a student brings up a point that the professor has not thought about before. It doesn't happen often, but it's always nice when it does happen. We're defending Brooke Wyndham, whose very wealthy husband was found shot to death in their Beacon Hill mansion. Gold digger? You'd think so, since the stiff was 60, but she was rich on her own, some kind of fitness empire. Faculty, let alone faculty members who also have a high-profile case, would not have the time to bring an intern up to speed. This task would be given to a paralegal or maybe an associate. It's about ferocity, carnage, balancing human intelligence with animal diligence. Mm -hmm. Knowing exactly what you want and how far you'll go to get it. How far will L go? Are you hitting on me? You're a beautiful girl. <laughs> so everything you just said? I'm a man who knows what he wants. And I'm a law student who just realized her professor is a pathetic asshole. There are professors who hit on their students, either for a short-term or long-term relationship. This was tolerated in the past because the students were adults. But more and more law schools have created policies prohibiting dating relationships between faculty and students due to the power imbalance. Um, first of all, I would like to point out that not only is there no proof in this case, but there's a complete lack of um, mens rea, which by definition tells us that there can be no crime without a vicious will. I am aware of the meaning of mens rea. What I'm unaware of is why you're giving me a vocabulary lesson when you should be questioning your witness. Yes, Your Honor. And this is exactly why law students aren't allowed to try murder cases. The lawyer's role is to ask the witness questions, not to state the law. That being said, judges do tend to be gentler with law students, recognizing that this is a learning experience for them. Ladies and gentlemen, I present the graduates of Harvard Law School, class of 2004. I am personally very honored to introduce this year's class elected speaker. After getting off to a quite interesting start here at Harvard, she graduates today with an invitation to join one of Boston's most prestigious law firms. I am sure we are going to see great things from her. Ladies and gentlemen, Elle Woods. Harvard Law School graduates can practice law anywhere in the country. They don't have to stay in Boston unless they want to. And as you look at that room, far too small for the graduates and all of their guests. It's highly unlikely that he would have had no job offers. We know that he comes from a politically connected family, this means getting hired at a firm that understands his connections and potential to get elected to high office. Overall, this movie captures some of law school's reality. It's a fun movie, and I recommend you watch it if you've never seen it before. It shows how someone can reach their full potential when they look for validation within. New videos every other Wednesday, so make sure to tune in so you can become a better student and a better lawyer.